Hi, my name is Michelle. I'm an animation student, meaning that I think about art a lot, as well as ways I can push my work into new territory. Sometimes what I'll do is look at illustrations with really unique styles and wonder, how would this look animated? And further, how would I animate it? This is something I made recently based on these inspirations. Today, we'll be going through my animation workflow, breaking this down bit by bit. Before we get started, a big thank you to Clip Studio Paint for sponsoring this video. For this project, I'll be using Clip Studio Paint X, a painting program that also comes with robust animation tools. One of my favorite things about Clip Studio Paint is definitely the feel of the brushes. Almost all of them have a lovely taper at the end and respond nicely to pressure. Here are some brushes I enjoy using, as well as some that I've imported from Photoshop. Anyways, sometimes when I'm feeling stuck, I'll turn to either compiling or studying reference material. In my view, there's a lot of value taking a closer look at someone else's creative impulses. At least for me, it breaks me out of my own repetitive mold. This is Mucha, by the way, Alphonse Mucha. He was a Czech artist who lived in Paris during the Art Nouveau movement, though he preferred to disassociate from it because at the time it was too contemporary. In his words, he wanted his art to be timeless, and he no doubt delivered because I find myself admiring them more than a century later for their otherworldly elegance. While I won't be following all of my notes, the studies do get the ideas going. This was my first draft, and as first drafts go, it was a spontaneous stab in the dark more than a fully formed idea. For my second pass, I chose to explore something more elegant instead of intense. Note the elements I'm bringing in from Muka's work, namely asymmetrical flowing lines and an abundance of detail. Also note how despite the amount of details, the plant matter still feels organized. While they all occupy their own space, they follow a larger shape, reinforcing a sense of flow. After I finished my sketch, I quickly blocked in some color keys just to see what sorts of options I had. I ended up going with option A because it felt the most clear and unified clear in that the warmer colors are packed into the center and immediately draw your eye, and unified in that the colors emphasize what's already felt with the lines. Okay, let's start animating. Now, I wouldn't say that Clip Studio Paint is the most efficient animation software for long and complex shots, but for something short and sweet where brushwork is important, it works quite nicely. Just make sure to set up shortcuts for an easier life. Usually, my first step is to think about how I'm going to plan my animation, and what I mean by that is what method am I going to use to animate, straight ahead or pose to pose. In short, straight ahead refers to animating chronologically, pose to pose means planning your animation using keys and breakdowns, then adding in-betweens. Now, I want to be clear when I say this, neither is better than the other, they both suit different purposes. The reason why I wanted to cover these methods is because I won't just be using one to animate my character. The animation will happen in two parts. First, I'll be working on the head, body, and limbs using the pose-to-pose -pose method because the action is thoughtful and intentional. It would benefit from a more structured approach. Then and only then, I'll be adding the hair using the straight-ahead method because, you guessed it, its movement is free-flowing and hard to predict. Without further ado, here are my keys breakdowns, and in-betweens for the head and body. For me, the most challenging part during the stage was the head turn. How do I convey the turning of a complex three-dimensional form on a two-dimensional surface? Here are some things that helped me. On a sphere-like object, things closer to the center appear to move larger distances than things on the edges as they travel towards than away from you. If what I just said made absolutely no sense, don't worry, I think I tuned out as well. Let me give you another example. This is a cup. It's spinning at a consistent speed. Now let's view it from the side. I'm going to mark the placement of the handle as it spins. Do you see what I mean now? Things closer to the center appear to move larger distances than things on the edges. So on my character, I can expect to see the most movement here. 
The second and better tip I have is just to look at yourself in the mirror. Notice how the shape of your jaw changes as you look up, how your eyelids unfold, or how more of your upper lip is revealed. It's always the little things like these that build up and make a difference, especially when you're animating slow, subtle action. Now that I've blocked in the head, I'm ready to start roughing out the hair. It was a little bit intimidating tackling such a complex structure, but the key to managing complexity is knowing how to break things down. I first started with a pass that mostly considers the larger shape. This was a first attempt where I experimented with the wind blowing her hair from side to side, but I wasn't convinced it was the best direction for the piece. My second attempt explored wind that blew from the center out, and this ended up working much better with my symmetrical composition. I also wanted the wind to increase in strength as my character looks up to make their actions feel more impactful. For my second pass, I began to subdivide this larger shape into smaller parts, this time considering how each strand moves individually. Now that I have a good idea of how I want my animation to look, I'm going to go in and clean up the lines. If you're cleaning up areas that don't change a whole lot, what you can do to save time and make your drawings feel more consistent is to copy and paste lines and shift them slightly using the transform tool. Alright, so much earlier I created a color key, now I'm going to refine it so that I have a solid plan for how I'm going to finalize my piece. Coloring is an incredibly repetitive and time-consuming process, so in an effort to make this easier for myself, I'm being slightly more restrained with how much detail I pack in. In Muka's work, for example, I'm noticing that he'll most thoroughly render the face and leave everything else flat. Despite this, his work doesn't feel incomplete because he's just slightly elevating the focal point. On the same note, I don't have to detail every single thing in order to make my piece feel complete. This is also the stage where I finished up my background. I'm keeping the stalks on separate layers to be able to animate them later. Now, onto the actual coloring part. Typically, I'll make a new layer for every new color introduced, the reason being it's much easier to make edits afterwards if everything is separated. And yes, this means a lot of layers. At the very bottom, I have a base layer which I use as a starting point for every layer above. My torso layer, for instance, is just a duplicate of the base layer with the arms cropped off. This way, I don't have to go retrace, then refill the areas I've already done for the base layer. After that, I have some cast shadows, a layer for the hand and shoulder armor, one for the head, and multiple layers for each of the painted details on the face. Finally, one layer for the hair, another for its form shadows, another for its cast shadows, and one more to introduce a reddish hue. Oh, and the sword. The way I was able to keep my brush strokes in detailed areas like the face consistent was because I just made one brush stroke, then copied and pasted it onto all my other frames. This saved a lot of time and kept me from going insane. Okay, so we're almost there. As a final step, I'm going to export my layers and compile them in After Effects. To make the plants move, I used an effect called Wave Warp. Typically, you'll have to mess around with these values over here to design the movement you want. That usually means setting either length or width to a really big number, fine-tuning the angle, and adjusting the speed. And to make the sword glow, all you have to do is make a duplicate of the layer, throw in some Gaussian blur, and play with blending modes as you see fit. Anyways, here's the final result. Thank you, as always, for sticking with me until the end. I realize that this might be intimidating for those of you who are just starting out, but I'd like to say that this is very much the result of years of built-up knowledge and experimenting outside of my comfort zone. If you're just starting out, I strongly encourage you to expose yourself to different kinds of art from different times or places and study those you admire, because I've found that it's those things that have helped me shape my voice the most. Anyways, I really appreciate it. Happy animating.